So as I believe I said, um, I think in my first vlog, actually purchasing a uh, DSLR Canon 80D with the intent of starting a vlog five and a half years ago, <clears throat> that one step directly led me into therapy and treatment and all sorts of things because at a subconscious level, because I didn't know any of my abuse, I, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know I had been abused. Um, it was entirely repressed. But this subconscious fear of if you actually say anything true or real and, or important in public, you're going to be uh, destroyed. And so I noticed this fear coming back, hopefully in a more conscious way now, because there are some parallels between my childhood abuse um, and how I see control over the way that language is used uh, in the public domain. And it concerns me rather a lot um, because, again, because of my childhood abuse, I know that controlling one's speech, what you're allowed to say, without some horrible outcomes being a consequence, if you can control someone's speech, you can dominate them quite thoroughly. Um, and so seeing how the far left is really sometimes with good motives in mind and sometimes not, has really capitalized on a form of power uh, that they don't often admit is power. If you are able to control someone's speech or entire cultures and what you can and cannot say in public, that is a massive form of power. Um, and often when people get power, they don't really want to relinquish it. Um, but when they aren't even able to admit that it is power that they like, that is also, I think, uh, pro a problem. And if they justify their actions by saying, well, we're trying to help people who have been historically oppressed, then there's even less reason to look at their own motives for wanting to wield power uh, in cultures. And so part of my fear, part of the internal terror, really, the past four or five days is I know intuitively and unconsciously, but it's become conscious that if I constrain what I say to recovery, I'm reasonably safe. But if I actually allow myself to speak freely on any number of topics, uh, that safety is going to go away. I will open myself up to attack because, well, the number of things you can't talk about unless you adopt the far left's official position, the number of those topics has gone up and up and up. And so every time I notice I have a thought that doesn't fit neatly into those, the things you're allowed to say, I end up self-censoring. And the thing is, for someone with my, my history, my history of childhood abuse, what ends up happening when I self-censor is I end up feeling suicidal, or my inner five-year-old ends up feeling suicidal. And then it brings on this feeling of when you can't say something true out loud, that can literally distort your ability to understand what is or is not real. And so when I self-censor to whatever degree of 
with as much awareness as I can. I'm trying to keep myself safe because I know if you say certain things um, in public, you're, you're opening yourself up to abuse. But if I don't allow myself to say any of these things, my inner five-year-old feels suicidal. So there has to be a way in which I can start opening up what I actually believe. And it's a very kind of dichotomous feeling because I can find the inner five-year-old that is terrified to say something that'll get him attacked. And yet, there is another aspect of my identity. And interestingly, I also think it's still, it's still a five-year-old, but not exclusively five-year-old being like, I don't care if you hate me. I don't care if you attack me. Um, if I deeply feel something to be true, I will say it out loud. And so that's why the past however many vlogs I've been looking into the issue of, of heroism and what is that? Because there is always some degree of putting yourself at risk because of some value or values that you hold and your unwillingness to compromise those values because if you act on them, you might put yourself at risk. So you do act on them, knowing it will, you will put yourself at risk. And to me, that's heroic. Um, and so there has been something of a battle royale in my psyche between the parts of myself saying you can't do that, the self-censoring parts, you can't do that, um, you'll put yourself in danger. Um, and then the other parts of me saying, well, that's exactly why you should say them out loud, because it's what you truly believe. And if you don't say it, who is going to? And if you don't stand up for yourself, and that's the other thing, I think that is one of the prime responsibilities of oneself to oneself is to stand up. For oneself and so that that inner five-year-old is looking at the 40 year old in me and being like you won't stand up for me or you you won't stand up for me publicly you'll do it in uh, closed rooms in therapy and treatment and meetings or whatever it may be but you won't stand up for me publicly what the actual hell. And because there are so many parallels between what very much looks like thought policing from the far left, because if you don't follow those rules, you can get yourself fired. Or they can get you fired, more accurately. Um, so those are tangible, real-world consequences to speech and this thing of losing track of what you actually believe because you're too afraid to say it out loud is of real concern because if you act in the public sphere as if you agree with the new rules surrounding what you cannot can and cannot say you might over time lose track of what you actually believe and because you want to keep yourself safe, you want to stay employed, you don't want to be excommunicated by your social group, you may adopt beliefs you don't actually believe. And you've, then you've lost track, lost, you're not in touch with your own soul anymore. That's not healthy. That's not healthy on an individual level, and I can't imagine that's healthy on a societal level either. And so I notice... I notice on YouTube, I find myself being attracted to um, speakers, typically conservative speakers, who are saying things uh, that the far left very much doesn't like. But a lot of what they say, not all of it, but a lot, used to be what we just called rational thought. 
And why can't we do that anymore? So that's, that's the thing. If you can control speech in a culture and within an individual, that, in, well, let's put it this way. If you freely agree to a certain set of norms, um, like, let's call it civilized debate, well, then you've agreed to those terms to speak about difficult things. Um, but if you are feeling threatened into self-censoring, that's, that's domination. That is absolutely domination. And I don't respond well to that. And then a counter argument that the far left could come back with, because I just used the word domination, it would be like, oh, well, that's what we're trying to address is the domination of these minority populations. And we're trying to address that. And that may be so in some ways. But when you're using force and threats to either get people to agree with you or to shut down even the possibility for people who don't agree with you to speak in the public sphere, that you're literally policing what people can and cannot say in public. And often it ends up being a mob mentality. And mobs are scary. And I think it's really problematic. And obviously I'm not the first person to point this out, but when you self-select into echo chambers online and news media and all of that, no one is having conversations with the people they most likely need to be having conversations with, the people who do hold different views. And there is some truth that obviously you're going to find people with whom you have a natural affinity and you will want to engage those conversations with people you have that natural affinity and that's, that's great, but those can't be the only people you have conversations with. Because you know, you absolutely know that Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, um, Hezbollah, Hamas are all looking at the United States and at Europe the past however many years and be like, oh good, they are ripping themselves apart. They are making themselves weaker. And one of the people I've been encountering on YouTube is Douglas Murray. Um, and so even just the title of his books are really interesting. The War on the West, The Strange Death of Europe, The Madness of Crowds. Because if you really have to stop and think, if Russia, China, Hamas, Hezbollah, North Korea, Iran, are looking at the West with glee, seeing our weakness, and seeing when they can take advantage of that weakness to their own gain, who do you really want to be in charge of your life? If you hate the West so much, hate Western institutions, do you want Chinese institutions? They don't even have their own, they have their own isolated internet. You, you can't even mention Winnie the Pooh because of Xi's 
thin skin and vanity. So, fine, critique. Critique the West. Critique the things that need critiqued, obviously. But there is a line past which you, you're actually tearing down Western civilization and not seeing any of the good. And that does that feels actually insane and nihilistic. Our Western democracies are not perfect. Their historical foundations are often bathed in blood and repression. But that is not all they are. That is not all they represent. And it starts to look like incredible naivete and immaturity to so publicly say you, you hate the West and everything it represents when if you are exposed to real totalitarianism, you would be crushed. Because that's what the real totalitarians are doing. Looking at the West. And saying, and seeing the more divided we are against each other, it just makes it easy for the real totalitarians to assert their values on the world.